So howdy folks, and thanks for taking the time to come watch this talk, uh, both of the, those of you in Oklahoma, who I wish I could be joining in person, and everyone else who's cruising in the Slack cyberspace. Uh, at here, hello. As I mentioned in the intro, uh, I'm a cartographer with the Washington Post. Uh, before that, I worked at the Wall Street Journal doing much the same work, maps, charts, and illustrations for the news. Uh, this talk is less about any of that directly and more about the joy, execution, and turmoil of personal projects. And while this is titled Maps of Exploration, could have really gone with a bunch of other things, like how to learn new skills or you know, your annual Make Bad Maps talk. Uh, but the inspiration for this talk came mostly out of a jealousy of music artists and a fear of stagnation. Uh, cartography is in part art, if Venn diagrams are to be believed, and part of the best art takes huge swings, right? Uh, at the end of a, mu a musician's life, they've got a catalog of all the albums that are beautiful snapshots of who they were or trying to be at that point in time. This is most visible with pop artists, where you know changing looks is 99, not 100% a gimmick to sell albums and standouts, but it's still kind of admirable, right? The definition, even if playbook marketing, is fun and revealing. Full, al full albums themselves are a visual di diary, almost a package of who they were at that point. Uh, this is what they wanted to make at that point in time. Uh, it's harder to go that honest or wild with the kind of mapping most of us do. Uh, most cartography work is feeding the beast, broadly speaking. For journalists, that's you know endless locator maps. For government agencies, this might be delivering the always to style as re-exports. Maintaining a map often means maintaining or to a standardized design principles laid out by a style guide that may change when someone has the time, which is hardly ever, because you know we're making useful things people need. I liken it to the web's current UI UX depression, right? Where obviously a white background with a menu bar and the content in a cinder gutter is the ideal interface for most devices and interactions. And while we can bemoan those sites for not taking more artistic risks, I find it hard to imagine there isn't a ton of research backing it up. Uh, hopefully there's an elbow room for creative freedom, but on the clock and when you're beholden to your employer or your client's needs, there's a style guide and morally, you should probably deliver what works versus going experimental, such as the Crystal Corner Bar of Madison, Wisconsin. But if you don't have a client and you're not doing it for the boss, now you've got some runway. Uh, I'll be talking here about two such projects I put together over the course of last year, Maps from Home and Covers, both pieces I wanted to make that didn't quite fit in with the nine to five work I traditionally do. So a couple of caveats up front, uh, weekends are good. Um, I'm not saying you need to do this to be successful or get ahead or any of that YouTube guru bowl. I hope it comes across that the goal is more here. Uh, when you have gas in your tank and an idea you're excited about trying out, uh, you should go for it. And here's some hopeful tips to help you get started on that. Um, but if you do start and something comes up or maybe you're just not actually feeling it, it's fine to wait until the inspiration hits again. Like no one's gonna really care about this project as much as you do. So like enjoy the ride of it, right? Um, also focus here is gonna be on how you can kind of utilize these ideas you have to learn new skills. But I do wanna note that like, if you can get paid to learn, like definitely do that. So first off, maps from home. Uh, the piece starts with a seemingly static map showing just my hometown dotted and labeled as we typically do. But then the piece continues um, and it starts to zoom in on the dot and it reveals my memories of home. Uh, these are all little illustrations of various moments of my like childhood and adolescence in Janesville, Wisconsin. Uh, the piece continues with some observations of Midwest living and ends on a note on how for every person who has ever lived, the black dot we use to sum up their homes on the map has these stories kind of buried inherently within. And uh, it seemed to resonate with a lot of people, which uh, made me very happy to see. Um, so th this idea has been kind of kicking around my head for quite a long while. Uh, I actually mentioned it in the rough concept in a talk at ACES in 2017, but it goes back far before then, excuse me, uh, I think to around uh, 2015, uh, the initial concept, <laughs> Uh, sorry about that. Can I, can I get this part I cut out of the recording? Yeah, yeah, we can cut it out. Cool. 
Oh, yeah. Burden to bring home. Uh, okay, I'll pick up from wherever the phone started ringing there. Um, but it goes back before then, I think to 2015. The initial concept was to do something more historic based. Uh, so you'd start with a dot of, say, like Chicago, and then you'd zoom in and see the history of the town's founding or you know labor movement or some kind of you know, historic element uh, of that city that uh, is why the city is the way it is today. Uh, however, the amount of research to do that well would be substantial, and you know, you'd want to do that well to respect the place. Um, but that did get me thinking that uh, maybe a better place to use this would be for a thing that would take a lot less research, i.e. myself. We're all experts on ourselves, after all. Uh, overall, this took about a month to put together, though the active time actually making it was closer to a handful of evenings and you know, two full days. Granted, those days were done while attending Mesa's 2020. Uh, kudos to anybody who's out there multitasking right now. Initially, I was going to make an effort to geolocate my memories, evidenced by this tape together base map, um, and kind of throw it on the light board, draw over it. But you know, you have more memories in the school you went to and your home, you know, the place you actually lived versus down the river. Uh, so that got scrapped. But the sketching still did really help uh, kind of move things along, which you can kind of see there. Uh, once I had kind of sketches done for each of the individual memories, I kind of then moved over to a big old piece of paper, sketched it, inked it, and after two days I had this lovely illustration. Uh, not pictured here is the attempt to convert this to a shape file, which uh, was uh, took maybe a couple hours to crack, but ultimately just slapping this over uh, map box map as a raster worked much, much better. Uh, and I think like this is the obvious win of the piece. I still have this uh, hanging up on the wall and it's very satisfying to look at. But there's a lot of like smaller victories in the piece uh, elsewhere. Um, I really wanted it to affect people when they got to the page and to think the initial map was not interactive. So as part of that, overlaid like a little fade around it. Um, I think we're kind of used to seeing square maps online and assuming you kind of pan and zoom on them. But so I think this effect works to some extent. Uh, another small victory was the final map, which had a pulsating coastline. Uh, I wanted the final map to feel alive in a way, and like the idea of this. I won't dwell on like the how-to because that's not really important. Uh, here it is if anyone's curious. Um, but it was an extraneous feature, but it was a really fun problem to solve. Um, so when I did that, uh, to me, I think that's like the sweet spot for motivation. In contrast, I also have a small comic in the middle about uh, gushing about life in the Midwest following living in a city for five years. Uh, this is pretty half-assed. Uh, I could have spent more time on it, been more clever with the observations, drawn it better, but like it conveys the point. And again, there were so many other parts of this project that were more exciting to me that like this does the job, it's fine. So takeaways, uh, one, don't feel bad if you're not currently working on a great idea you have. When the stars align, go for it. Until then, it's fine to let it gestate. Uh, along the same lines, the joy of the personal project is that you're generally doing it for yourself. You can impose deadlines on yourself if that helps, but otherwise the lack of them should be seen as a boon. No one's waiting with bated breath for your next thing, though I'm sure they'll enjoy it. So take the time to make it and make it right. Uh, if there's part of a project you know is more route or less important to the overall dream, just focus on the stuff you want to do and get that done uh, as you're working on it. And then finally, if you don't have any data or don't have the time to do research, try to maybe make it personal. Uh, the next project I was going to talk about was Covers, which I put out in the spring of this year. And it was largely inspired uh, by Joy Maps, uh, which are elevation profiles. Uh, so these, these come, I, I believe they originate from just uh, kind of tributes to this uh, fa very famous album artwork from the 80s. Uh, and secondly, uh, this concept, which I also had kicking in my head for a while, and I love this dum dumb idea so dearly. Uh, when you see tribute maps, it's usually done in the sense of copying symbols or design elements, um, but usually not like much, much more than that. Uh, I love the idea of how overboard and ridiculous this was, taking Dark Side of the Moon and converting roads into rainbows as they spit out. It just kind of feels right in how wrong it is. Uh, so the top of this here, I finally put it together. But while tinkering on it, I also remembered the joy plot, or joy map kind of style, and started wondering for inspiration. Some were obvious, 
and put, you know, quick to put together and fun. Uh, have you ever noticed that Manhattan is shaped like a banana? It's perfect. And not to mention that this was a great excuse to dig into some techniques I hadn't, you know, had the time to really dig into yet. In this case, overlaying an image texture over a blender relief. Uh, hat tip Daniel Huffman for that tutorial. Uh, also a super small thing, but it filled me with so much joy to discover that uh, where there was a Latin mountain in Washington, there's a little lake in like the perfect spot to kind of mimic uh, Ziggy's uh, tear pool there. Uh, then came the talking heads idea for this. Um, while the others were kind of put together fairly quickly, like you know, an hour or two maybe for each, uh, this one ended up being a fantastic lift uh, and kind of a struggle bus too. The inspiration, more songs about buildings and foods, has Polaroids of the band members taken up clips and then messily put together in a 23 by 23 grid. Um, for my version of it, I wanted to do this, but with imagery of the US. So challenges here. One, pick 529 spots in the US to crop to. Two, get high enough resolution imagery to kind of crop to it without it looking too blurry. Three, clip that imagery by the bounds picked from one, and then four, position them in the grid, all distributed like this. Uh, super big pain, and maybe there's a faster way to do this, but uh, this one took a hot while. Um, so for one, here's how you solve the first problem of just picking 529 different points of interest. Uh, for the second challenge of finding the imagery, I could have used NASA's blue marble, but at the city level, I thought it came across as a little bit too blurry for my taste. Um, I tried instead Landsat at first and did Google Earth Engine to pull down uh, cropped areas that I had gotten from the first step. Uh, but when I kind of actually did this, the colors are kind of weird. They're all very, very blue. Uh, the resolution is kind of poor. And I also messed up the file names. So they loaded in the incorrect uh, format. So you get this lovely little mess uh, that's shown there. When that didn't seem like it was working very well, I thought, well, okay, I can maybe use Mapbox and just load, uh, you know, around 250 instances of a Mapbox map on there. But alas, no. Uh, while I was excited to see what loading around 250 maps uh, per page load would do to my monthly billing statements, uh, they only let you load 16 instances before they start to kill all the previous ones. So uh, back to satellite imagery it goes. And eventually I found a tutorial on pulling down some cloudless Sentinel imagery. Uh, from AWS. And following that, I was able to get um, this lovely composite of the US. Uh, this is right before the final version of it. So there's still the mess of seeing some black and white lines on there from projections and a complete, a complete uh, struggle bus of a thing. But all in all, when I did finally get it all together, it resulted in this lovely piece, uh, the fruits of odds and ends of three weekends. It's maybe a little underwhelming. Uh, I still feel a great kind of sense of pride of it. Uh, and oddly, like while kind of working on this about a week after I kind of cracked how to do all the stuff I previously mentioned, uh, I was assigned to work on a story at the Wall Street Journal about Fukushima and assessing the broad damage to Japan's coastline following the tsunami of 2011. And I was able to use pretty much the exact same pipeline I'd been doing for the Talking Heads map there. Uh, for that, I pulled down imagery of Japan, uh, then overlaying that imagery over elevation model uh, in Blender, I kicked that out using the same settings as the Ziggy map. And the result was, I think, this pretty gorgeous uh, rendering of Japan. Uh, this is just with Sentinel imagery and an elevation model. Uh, the elevation is exaggerated, as is legally required of all Blender maps. And the satellite layer was a little bit saturated, but you know, both by probably less than you would think. For the story itself, the imagery was muted considerably. You always want the data to kind of stand out, right? Uh, but it still felt great to get that level of understanding to the terrain and the coast in this piece. And of course, to see you know something I had done kind of for myself end up being so useful for an actual uh, big project, a work project, I should say. Uh, another thing happened while working on these two was that the scope just kind of exploded. Initially, I was going to only do the static pieces version of it, but like they all kind of started calling out for like, hey, you could animate these and make them even kind of more interesting or more fun. Uh, so I think I had finished most of the static iterations of these uh, 
sometime in February. And then eventually the resulting project uh, covers didn't come out until I think like mid early April. And a large part of that was because of just deciding like I can animate these, they can all kind of become their own thing. Uh, so I invite you to go check it out. Uh, there's a couple of maps I didn't show here that are a part of that. Um, yeah, I'm all, all together really satisfied with kind of like how it all came together and creating these uh, cartographic toys for people to kind of explore. So takeaways from that, um, indulge in the rabbit holes. Uh, personal work is a great way to flex into new skills. Libraries or applications you might not otherwise have the time to. Uh, make bad maps. They're going to be some of the most satisfying you put together. <laughs> um, and a great way to kind of discover niche GIS processes you might not otherwise run into. Um, it helps that there's like a million ways to do most GIS tasks too, and especially when the stakes are this low. You know, it's just it's a great way to kind of explore and learn. So that's uh, all I came to discuss on those projects, at least in a 20 minute frame. But if you have any questions about any particulars of either, uh, always happy to talk. You can reach out to me on Slack uh, or in person when that becomes a thing again. I will hopefully see you all in 2022. Uh, but outside of like the pep talk advice, I did want to drop some practical stuff as well. Um, so I, I publish on a personal blog uh, that's kind of accumulation of three years worth of code. Um, but if you are kind of wondering, like, where should I put things or, you know, online, I would highly recommend, like, you can just start with a Tumblr or an Instagram or WordPress. Uh, my first uh, blog was just a Tumblr made seven years ago. And a lot of the design elements actually carry over into my current site as well. Uh, if you're a web dev, uh, Jekyll is phenomenal and not that hard to kind of pick up. So. Uh, check out that if you are curious about doing uh, web-based kind of projects. Uh, next, I'm writing a cookbook of sorts. Um, anytime I've kind of run into a very difficult GIS task or a, a more programmatic uh, problem, I've tried to document the solutions uh, at this website. Um, it's, it's just on my GitHub, uh, Dylan Moriarty slash cookbook. And if you click on the wiki, uh, you'll be able to find it. Um, the Sentinel stuff I was doing for the Talking Heads map is roughly outlined uh, here, as well as a couple of guides for like what satellites to use, what the satellite resolutions are, as well as um, how to take NOAA data and get a quick map of uh, various weather phenomena. So uh, check that out. And then finally, um, as I kind of emphasized, you can sit on ideas for a while. You shouldn't beat yourself up too much if like you know three months pass and you haven't started something yet just like make sure you write it down somewhere where like you know don't necessarily uh throw it away or trust yourself to remember um this is the long laundry list of things i am still working on and that someday we'll see the day uh light of day hopefully <laughs> but uh, i'm also not necessarily in a big rush on uh, any of these in particular so uh yeah i hope your projects find the light of day at some point as well and uh Cheers.